Take your hymnals and open them up to 73. Jump. That was our opening. Just take it off the mute. That was our opening hymn this morning. Diana just read and finished with the text, Be ye holy, for I am holy. What does that mean? What does it mean for us to be holy because God is holy? Are we intrinsically holy? No. So how can we be holy? How can God expect something from us that we can never be? Are you open to page uh, or number 73, Holy, Holy, Holy? You guys familiar with this song? Yes. Don't worry, don't get afraid, I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> Let me find the verse here. It's going to be the third stanza. It says, Holy, 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 though darkness hide thee, Though the eye of man thy glory cannot see, why can not the eye of man see the glory of God? Because, because God is holy, and man is not, right? And so, God would become a consuming fire if we, in our unrighteousness and unholiness, stood in His presence. Is that right? Amen. But let's keep looking at that verse. It says, only thou art holy, and there is none beside thee, perfect in power, love, and purity. And yet the scripture says to us, be holy, for I am holy. How can that be? You're, you're shaking your heads. That's a good thing. Say it out, Ricky, because you're right. Holy through Christ can we be holy. Do you understand why you need a Savior? Why it is so important that God sent Jesus as our Messiah, as our Redeemer? Because through Him, then we can actually stand in the presence of God. We right? become fire -proof. What's that? We become fire -proof. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I want you to think about this. Was Jesus just using hyperbole when he made this statement? Is he just exaggerating? Or is the statement true? Are we, as God's people, to be holy? Yes. And to be holy is to be like him. Is that correct? Now, I'm going to speak to you this morning, and I had my sermon paper, and I forgot it on my desk. Doesn't really matter, there wasn't a whole lot on it, so. But what I'm going to speak to you this morning and share with you, I want you to listen very carefully and I want you to think about this. Jesus gave signs for us to be able to see where we are in the history of this world. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Jesus told his disciples what would be the sign of his coming. Okay, they asked him. Very clearly, what will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age? Remember, all these things take place. And Jesus gave them signs and way marks that throughout history you could see that when they came, uh, when they were fulfilled, you would know where you were at in God's time of when He would return. Is that right? And so we in this generation like to say we're living in the last days. How do we know that? Well, because we probably see things fulfilled that are in prophecy. Is that right? Okay, so, and that's what I want to look at this morning. The first text I want to look at is, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. You familiar with Matthew chapter 5? That is the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? So, Matthew chapter 5, as we read these verses, I want you to always keep in mind what Jesus said here in 1 Peter. That we should be holy because He is holy. 
that if you call yourself a Christian, there should be a lifestyle that goes with that that shows that you truly are a Christian. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, let's look at verses 38 and 39. Verse 38 says what? Ricky, you have that? Yes. What does it say? You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Was it said that? Was it said in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Yes. Yes, said it in Exodus, right? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How could God say that then, and Jesus is about to say something different? Wasn't it Jesus who said it then? Yes. Doesn't that cause you to think a little bit? Isn't this the same God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever? So what you need to take away from this, that's Exodus 21-24. And it's taken, just a very little bit, is taken from the whole context of what was said. An eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. What you need to take away from this is that this was the same Jesus who said both of these things. And Jesus doesn't change. God doesn't change. So he had a reason for saying it then, and he has a reason for saying this now. And it's not a different dispensation. Okay? You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist what? What is the definition of an evil person? See, because if you can't come up with an answer for that, then you have no idea who not to resist. And that's the problem with the church today in America. God is plain when he says, do not resist an evil person. And he goes on to say, if that evil person slaps you on the cheek on the one side, what do you do? <laughs> All right. This is what I want, to think, want you to think about this morning. The Bible tells you to be ye perfect because your Father in heaven is perfect. How are we who are sinful to be perfect? We are perfect when we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and we live a life of love. Right? Because Paul makes it plain that love is the fulfillment of what? Of the law. What kind of love is the fulfillment of the law? It is the love that Jesus modeled for all the years that he lived on this earth. A love that is unselfish. A love that puts others before themselves. The love that we have today is self-preservation love. That my needs outweigh your needs. I will help you if I can, but if your needs are in contradiction to my needs, my needs come first. That's the world we live in today. And that is in the church as well as outside of the church. When Jesus said that do not resist an evil person, can you give a definition of what an evil person would be? Lawlessness. Lawlessness? It's good. That's good. An evil person. Someone that doesn't follow the dictates of God. Right? How about a government that doesn't follow the dictates of God? And what does Jesus say for you to do with that? Caesar. The things that are Caesar's do not resist. If that government slaps you on the right cheek, turn to that government your left cheek. Paul makes it plain that we are to submit to the governing authorities because they have been put there by God. Now who was the governing authority in Rome when Paul wrote that? Which one? Nero. You guys remember Nero? He was a godly chap, wasn't he? <laughs> I want you 
want you guys to understand this. When Paul said to submit, he was telling them to submit to the authority of Nero because God placed them there. It's kind of hard to swallow. Now, this sermon this morning is not going to be easy. I hope you guys wore some strong shoes. Maybe some steel toed shoes because I only step on some toes. And I'm doing it so that you think. It's the only purpose is I want you to think. I'm not telling you what to think. I just want you to think. If Jesus has called us to not resist the evil person, to turn the other cheek, then brothers and sisters, what are you going to do when that evil actually touches your life? When your cheek is slapped, will you fight back, which is what the world tells you to do? Or will you not resist and turn the other cheek and show the world Jesus Christ? Jesus never said following Him was going to be easy. And He said if you can't do this, you're not worthy of Him. So there's not a lot of wiggle room there. Either you're His disciples and you do what the Master says, you live the way the Master called you to live, or you are not His disciples. There is no middle ground. Again, I want you to think about what I'm saying. Just think. Thirty-eight, thirty-nine. But I tell you not to resist the evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Verse 40, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, does that have any meaning in our day today in 2014 here in New Smyrna Beach? We are a country that is established on the right of the individual. Is that right? I have my rights. Listen to talk radio. Especially if it's conservative talk radio with a Christian bent to it, and you will always hear about your Christian rights when it comes to your government. What did Jesus say your right was? Your right was to turn the other cheek. <clears throat> that if you're going to be sued and your brother wants your tunic, what did he say? Give him the tunic, but also give him... Do we do that today? We're very quickly to take them to court. I went through a whole thing about peacemaking here, right? To help each one of us here in the church learn how to deal with each other in the church when we have disagreements. But it was also for you guys to get to see how you should deal with the world around you. Jesus does not change whether you're inside the church or outside the church. Jesus does not change his expectations from you whether you live in a free country or a communist country. Is that right? Verse 41, whoever compels you to go one mile, do what? Do you know why he said that? Do you know why he actually said if someone compels you to go one mile? Because in his day, the law of the Romans were if a soldier asked you to carry his pack, he could make you carry it for a mile. And that was the law. What did Jesus say? If that happens to you, don't just carry it one mile. Don't just do what the law says, but go the extra mile. Now you know where we get that uh, phrase from. Okay. Go two miles. Those Romans, they were good chaps too, right? They were looking out for your best interest. In Jesus' day, did he not have a zealot that was in his personal uh, party of 12? What was that zealot's name? You said it. Simon? Simon the zealot, right? Now Simon the zealot, do you think that him... And Matthew, the tax collector, sat next to each other when they ate. No. You think when Jesus first called them, he had to actually separate those guys from one end of the table to the other? I think so. 
Because it took a while for them to actually, you know, get to like each other. Because the zealot hated the tax collector and wanted to kill him. Because they were, in their eyes, traitors to the nation. They were worse than Gentiles. Okay? And Jesus was able to take these two men, a zealot and a tax collector, and bring them into his personal family, that personal group of twelve, and those two went out and changed the world. The zealot, did he stay in his zealotry? After Jesus died, did he go back and join the zealot army? No. What did he do? He preached the gospel and he died preaching the gospel message. He gave up his right to be a zealot. And he gave up that ideology because he realized that that wasn't the kingdom that God had called him for. Now what I'm doing, brothers and sisters, is I'm laying the foundation because I'm going to talk to you and say some things that are going to really make you think, and I don't want you to throw anything at me. Okay? But I want you to think about what I'm saying and where we are today. But what I say has to be grounded in Scripture. Right? The foundation has to be laid in the words of Christ or the words of the Bible. Most people kind of shy away from the Sermon on the Mount because it speaks of things that are very hard to actually live out in practice. Well, John, yes. Can I say something? Sure. <clears throat> to, to get everybody in the right frame of mind, how Jesus started this Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of God. What he meant there was those who recognize their spiritual poverty. If we recognize our spiritual poverty, then we can go to the next step. Then we mourn. That's the question for those who mourn. And then the next step is, those, once we mourn, then we start to hunger. And that's blessed are those who hunger. And then the next one is blessed are those. And it, it keeps going. And it ends up right where you are now. Because Jesus had to lay a foundation to get the people to hear what he had to say because it was so radical compared to the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees. But let me ask you a question. When did people heard this, did they walk away and go, you can't do that? Or did they hear it gladly? Yes, they did. And were impressed with the way he spoke because he spoke not like the scribes and the Pharisees, but he spoke as one with power and authority. So listen. Give to him who asked you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, and what? Amen. Now, Leviticus 19.18 says you shall love your neighbor, but it doesn't say anything about hating your enemies. That was a tradition that was put in afterwards. Okay? And you know from the Old Testament, there's a story there, and it was either Elijah or Elisha. Where the enemy was struck blind. This was an army. was struck blind. And they came into the camp of the Jews. And the prophet was there. And the soldiers wanted to kill them because they were the enemy. What did the prophet say to them? Feed them. Give them drink. And send them on their way. You guys remember that story? Love your enemies. Model in the Old Testament as well as what Jesus is trying to tell you in the New Testament. There's no difference. There was no different dispensation. It's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. So, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who what? Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why should you do this? The answer is found in verse 45. Because if you do this, then you may be sons of your Father. Let her sit there as long as she needs. Oh, okay. Is your ankle okay?
You guys need to help her to wherever she's wanting to go. Because she's not going to be able to walk. She can see the I got a wheelchair in the back of my van. Yeah. That would be good. Can you hand it things in verse 45, so that you may be sons and daughters of the Father in heaven. For what does God do for us? He makes His Son rise on what? No. Have you ever thought of what it's like to be God? Of what He has to go through day in and day out? And the fact that He makes His Son rise on the good and on the evil, and that He has to be patient with the evil? We look at ourselves and say we have a relationship with God and through Jesus Christ we are saved. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But God has to look at us and look at the wicked and we say there's a difference between us and the wicked. But God says you're all the same. That's Romans. I've lumped you all together. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. And the only difference between you and them is that you accept my son. And what I want is for them to accept my son as well. That's the only difference. Do you understand the patience that God has for us? With us? In us? So, you see these texts, you see these verses. Jesus laid a firm foundation. What I want you to do is I want you to think of where we're at today. Jesus gave signs of his soon coming. Is that right? That there would be wars, rumors of wars, there would be famines, pestilences, uprisings, uh, the love of many would grow cold, children would be disobedient to their parents, parents would be bad parents to their kids, society will start to unravel. I want you to look at where we're at today. Are those things being fulfilled in your very sight? Look at the news. Senseless tragedies. A nine-year-old on a gun range is given a doozy and shoots the insurer. Now, I'm a gun proponent. Okay? But there is just, there, you got to have some type of sense. But I want you to think about this, this tragedy. What has it done? It has... Destroy this little girl because she has to live with this all the rest of her life. She's nine years old. Ten years from now, she's going to be 19. And that's the story she gets to hide or tell. She goes to bed at night. That's what she sees. Now, the family of this instructor who lost his life, if he had children, they'd have to grow up with this story of my dad died when I was his age. See how this tragedy just gets bigger and affects a wide range of people for many, many years. All right, now, school starts just last week, right? And most of Florida here, Central Florida school started. And in the Orlando area when it started, within three days of school starting, you had two flashers. One flashing a 12-year-old girl, another flashing a grown-up. Now, they wait until school starts. Every year when school starts, do you hear these stories? That's just wickedness. Okay? Wickedness. And we think we live in a great state. But this is what we deal with. And it happens all the time, and we become desensitized to it. Uh, how many of you have ever heard about two months ago, have ever heard of the name Ferguson? Now how many of you know that name? 
Okay? Right? What's going on there? Ferguson. Everybody's going to come down on one side or the other. And I'm not here to tell you which side. I'm just here to get you to think about how do you deal with what happened there with what Jesus said. Because if you come down on the side of the cop was right, then what Jesus asked you to do is stand in the shoes of the other side and have compassion on them to see how they live, how they think, why it's so painful. If you're on the side of the teenager, then Jesus' advice to you is to look at the other side and have compassion on them. See how they think, why they act the way they act, to put yourself in their shoes. But in our world today, we just come down on one side or the other. And if I'm here and you're there, you're the enemy. And I'm your enemy. And that's not what Jesus has called us for. What did Jesus say? If your enemy strikes you on the left cheek, do what? Turn him your right. Brothers and sisters, this country, in this point in time today, is mirroring what happened during the 1960s. Now, how many of you lived during that time and saw society unraveling before your eyes? The institutions that you thought were so great, if you were on one side, didn't look so great. If you were on the other side, the young people didn't look so great. Right? And it almost came down to a breaking up of this country back then. We're seeing the same things today. Okay? A lot of the problems that you had back then have never been addressed and have never been fixed. Why? Because we as Christians will not do what our master says. How many of you lived during the AIDS? Remember Ronald Reagan? If you're conservative, greatest president ever lived, right? If you're a liberal, I didn't like that guy so much. But Ronald Reagan did something in modern history that was kind of unique. And that was he blended religion and politics in such a great way that it was, you have to go back pretty far to see that kind of influence. You had the rise of the moral majority. How many of you guys remember that? The moral majority, right? And that they thought that if they could gain control of the political uh, power in this country, then they could bring Christianity to the forefront of this nation and the world. Is that was, is, was that Jesus' plan? Now, when I first joined the church, the Adventist church, I joined the Adventist church in the late 80s, at the rise of the moral majority. And it shocked me because I thought most Christians would be conservatives, Republicans. I came into the Adventist church and found a lot of them people were Democrats. That blew my mind. And it's like, how and why? And they said, because we see in this religious political movement the fulfillment of the end days. It's like, hmm, that's something to think about. And I realized right then that politics was not what Jesus was calling me for. Amen. That if I was conservative, then I'm conservative. But that doesn't mean that I don't like you because you're liberal. It doesn't mean that you can't belong in the same church or sit in the same pew as I do. If I'm liberal, it's the same thing. Now, I will tell you that I have been called conservative. I have been called the devil. I have been called liberal. I have been called a legalist. I have been called a liberal. Because apparently there's a lot of words for conservatives, but liberal kind of just takes care of everything else on the other side. And so we have these words that we like to put each other in. But Jesus was able to take a zealot and a tax collector 
He's able to take a bunch of fishermen and a doctor. Who was the doctor? They weren't part of the twelve, but he wrote one of the Gospels. Luke, a well-educated man. And he was a Jew, right? But you're thinking Luke was a Hellenistic Jew. Which is why he wrote a lot for and gave more information for the Gentiles. Okay? Luke's Gospel takes the genealogy of Christ all the way back to who? To Adam. God. Right? And that's, the, that's right, to God. And that's the only Gospel that does that. Did you know that? Luke gives you a lot more information coming from a non-Jewish perspective than any other Gospel. So, Jesus was able to take all of these men and women from different political persuasions and bring them into one family. If Jesus were here today, I think he would weep over us as he wept over Jerusalem because we are splintered. And it only takes one news article, one television show to splinter us. I could say about three sentences here and I would divide you guys that quick. But you'd throw something at me and I don't want to <laughs> Let me tell you something, Lester, you know this. It's a scary thing to be up here to talk to you because I have to watch what I say. Because if I say the wrong thing, then I, 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 I don't bring unity, I bring division. Right? And what's our, what's our job? Ricky? You. Lester? Gary? You. Ray was here. Our job is to try to unify you guys. To bring you together. For what reason? Because you are the family of God. But if you bring your political ideologies into this family and you expect that's what's going to be the prevalent motivation of the church, you're wrong. If you think that your cultural background is going to be the driving force of this church, you're wrong. The driving force of this church is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The only thing that's going to bring you and I together whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Hispanic, is Jesus Christ. That is why the world is split apart, and that is why the church is split apart. Because we do not serve Jesus Christ. We serve a Christ of our own making. Got your steel toe boots on there? Is that my turn? I am just as guilty as anybody here for this. But what God has shown me through the last probably five years, and in the last two years specifically, is that what the church needs is what Ellen White wrote over a hundred and some years ago. We need a revival of primitive godliness. But do we even know what primitive godliness is? It is trust. What Gary, that's what you said out there to me in the hallway. It is trusting in God for everything that you need. Jesus said in Matthew 24, when his disciples asked you, what will be the signs of the destruction of the temple and the sign of your coming? Do you know this story? Jesus was in the temple, and he was sitting by the collection boxes, and all the rich people came in, and they were putting in all their money, right? Now, the Bible says they threw their money into the collection box. When it comes to the widow's wife, what did he say she did? She, when she put it in the box, it says specifically, now, this is why you got to, when you read your Bible, you got to read the words and understand why he says what he says. When the rich people came, they threw their money in the box. It says that twice. Threw their money in the box. But when the widow came and she put in two coins, she dropped them in. What's the difference between dropping and throwing? Noise. The rich people came and put in their money and threw it in there so that everybody could hear all those coins hit the other coins. Right? They had a bag. 
The bag was big, so you could see it, and now you could hear it. What was the reason for it? To draw attention to themselves. When the widow put her money in, what did she do? She dropped it. Why? Because she was poor. And in her humility, isn't that what you said in the beginning, Ricky? How Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount? It went through steps. God resists the proud, but his heart is open to the humble. Right? And so the widow was humble. But what happened after this? After this, he tells his disciples that this poor woman put in more than any of these rich people. And they leave the synagogue, and his disciples take him and show him the temple, and they tell him, look at this magnificent building. You ever wonder why they said that after they left the church? Because they were having doubts about his economic prowess. How can you say that this woman who put in just two widow's mites was more than all these rich people? Because she gave from the heart. And with God, it's all about motive. God reads the heart. So, you know, Jesus looks at the magnificent temple and what does he tell his disciples? He says, I tell you the truth that not one stone here will be left upon another, but they will all be thrown down. When did that happen? Very good, Bob. 70 AD. Did Jesus give a warning to his followers that they would know when this happened so that they could leave and not be caught up in the destruction? Yes. Okay, what was the warning? The enemy withdrew. Right. So when you saw the abomination that makes desolate surrounding Jerusalem, then know it's time to leave. If you're in a field, don't go back to the house. If you're in the house, leave right then. Don't take nothing with you. Right? The word abomination that Jesus used, he used one other time. So it was twice. Do you know the other time that he used it? Right, well, you got you got the prophecy in Revelation that speaks of, again, it's just a quote from Daniel. And Jesus quoted from Daniel here, but he uses this word abomination. And I want you to think about this. And I want you to think about it by where we're at today in our society and our political uh, situation. So, Daniel's understanding of why Jerusalem was desolate because of the abomination of his people. They had rebelled against the Lord of the covenant and God allowed the Babylonians to destroy them. This word abomination is used twice in the Gospels to describe Daniel's prediction. Jesus used the same Greek word to describe the religious leaders. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Luke 16, verse 15 says, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is what? This is Luke 16, 15. What's the word? An abomination. That's that same word. Okay? What is highly valued among men is an abomination, or another version says detestable in God's sight. What was the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem? Jesus says, when you see the abomination standing in the holy place. <coughs> Here's two ways to think about this. The abomination standing in the holy place. Was that the Romans? When the Romans actually stood in the holy place, that holy place was destroyed. Right? So who was the abomination that was standing in the holy place? Was it not the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees? And the abomination was the detestable things of what they esteem to be right. Because what man seems to be right is detestable in the eyes of God. Do you know why the Romans came in and destroyed the temple? It's because the zealots revolted against the Roman authority. 
And this one man who claimed to be Messiah, Jesus also said, watch out for false messiahs. He ambushed and killed a whole garrison of Roman soldiers. Okay? And so, Rome's response was to come and serve with Jerusalem, and then they left. And then they came back, and when they came back in 70 AD, they destroyed everything. Why? Because the zealots thought they were doing God's will in killing and murdering the Romans and driving them out. Was that God's will? The zealots were a political party as well. And if you did not agree with their politics, they'd kill you too because you were a traitor. You were the enemy. That is the same place we're in today in our society here in America and in the church. If our politics are different, then we can only have a surface, shallow relationship. Because once you start stepping on those ideologies that are different, then we split apart. And God destroyed, allowed the temple to be destroyed because of that self-righteousness. Thinking that their way of thinking was God's way of thinking. Do we not do the same today? Look at your society. Look at your country. Look at your city. Think about what I'm telling you. If, and this is where I close, if you truly are going to be the generation that lives to see Christ come back, and the mark of the beast is enforced upon you who have the seal of God, and your government turns against you, and all the people who have taken the mark of the beast turn against you, and even some of your own brethren within the church turn against you, what are you going to do? Going to pick up arms? Defend yourself? Is that what God's calling you to do? Do you realize why God allows the time of trouble to come? Why God allows that generation of His followers to go through that? It is because that is what we need to finally, fully, completely trust Him. You got stockpiles of guns at your house, you're going to be good. You stockpiling food, it's not going to do you any good. Buy a big track of land out in the woods, it's not going to do you any good. Here you go. I told you this before. You buy a big track of land, do you not have to pay taxes on that land? Well, gee, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you ever going to pay your taxes? What happens when you don't pay your taxes? They come and take your land, right? You guys understand that if you are that generation, everything will be taken away from you, except for God. If God was able to feed Israel in the wilderness for 40 years by raining down bread, if he was able to feed Elisha by the creek, by birds bringing him bread, can he not take care of you? But will you trust him enough to do that? Now you get a better understanding of why Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes a second time, will he find faith on this earth? If you're that generation, he's talking to you. He's talking to me. We are a faithless, stiff-necked people. We honor God with our lips, but our hearts are far away from him. What is the fulfillment of the law? Whether you're from New Smyrna, whether you're from Daltona, whether you're from Ferguson, God has called you to love your brother and your sister. Whether they're in the church or out of the church. Love. Love is what's going to demonstrate to this world that we serve a risen Savior. Love is going to show this world that God is real, that God is in control, and that God is love. Closing hymn is number 469.